Hello, welcome to today's session on depth perception. We've talked previously about depth perception, and specifically we mentioned a few different monocular cues to depth. We talked about, for example, this notion of linear perspective, and we saw in class some examples of wonderful chalk art that gave us a compelling sense of depth, even in one eye's view, a monocular depth cue. We've also talked a little bit about another kind of monocular depth cue that we might think of as occlusion, the notion that I'm occluding portions of this screen as I walk in front of it, and nearer objects tend to occlude more distant objects. We also talked a little bit about how depth perception can arise from this notion of binocular disparity, and we call that kind of depth perception stereopsis. We talked about how we have retinal disparities that are either crossed and if they are crossed, they tend to generate the percept of things being relatively near in depth. If we have uncrossed retinal disparities, we have the corresponding psychological experience of something being further than the plane of fixation. We also talked about the horopter, the plane of zero disparity. So we learned how to create different kinds of depth uh, experiences by using different kinds of retinal disparity. Today we're going to continue that conversation and learn about some additional depth-related phenomena and also some other kinds of binocular phenomena. Specifically, today we'll be talking in depth about something called the Pulfrick effect, a fascinating case where we actually fool the cortex into thinking that there's a binocular disparity or a retinal disparity, when in fact one does not exist. We'll go on beyond that and talk a little bit about something called random dot stereograms. We'll talk about a case where the two eyes have difficulty combining their information. We call this binocular rivalry. And then we'll end with a cue to depth that is going to be a monocular cue, but it's going to be based on motion, and we call this motion parallax. So why don't we jump right into it today and begin talking about the Pulfrick effect, and we'll remind ourselves that we're going to come up with a very compelling sense of depth in this um, illusion, um, but there won't be any retinal disparities. We'll actually be at zero retinal disparity, and yet we'll get a compelling sense by fooling the cortex into thinking that there is a retinal disparity. Okay. So let's see if we can give you some idea about what will happen in class. This demo will only work in class, uh, unfortunately, but you can get an idea about it from the video, and it's important to develop some concepts about the Pulfrick effect in this video. So as we've done before in class, we're going to give you some filters, and these are polarized filters, and we might ask you to put the polarized filter in front of, for example, your right eye. Okay, so it would probably be best if you're doing this by holding with your left hand the filter over your right eye, so you're crossing in front of your chest, and now you're going to be looking through this filter, two eyes open, right eye is covered, okay, and I'll get into your orientation, if you'll excuse my back. So we're looking at the screen with our right eye covered. We can take now with our right hand a different polarized filter, and we can place that in front, and we can begin to rotate. Okay, and when we're rotating this, we're getting greater or lesser levels of light coming through for reasons that we had talked about before. While you're doing that with the filters in front of your eye, your right eye specifically, and your left eye is still open, I'll be in the front of the class swinging in a pendulum-like manner this very simple wiffle ball. It's going back and forth. Importantly, the wiffle ball is only moving in the horopter's plane, that is the plane of zero disparity. There's no... Uh, rotational motion going here. It's simply left to right motion. Okay? And then what we'll ask you to do is look at this simple pendular motion through the viewing arrangement that we had just a moment ago with your right eye filtered, and then you can vary the degree of filtration in your right eye, having more or fewer photons make their way onto your right retina. Okay? So what will happen then is you'll have an experience uh, that I think you'll find very interesting. This planar motion will appear to be three-dimensional. Okay? And uh, in order to understand why that's the case, we'll review what's going on. Just to recall, you've got planar motion and you've got your eye filtered. Uh, we'll try to understand now uh, what's going on at the level of cortical cells. Okay? At any one moment in time, you're focusing on that plane. You have no retinal disparity, but we'll ask what's going on now at the level of cortical cells. Uh, here's a diagram that will begin to explain it, and then we'll go into this diagram in some more depth. Okay? So, one important notion that we have is that when we talk about the intensity that's reaching the central nervous system in any way, it can be light intensity, or it can be um, sound intensity, when we have greater intensity, we tend to have faster cortical responses. So we have some kind of neural machinery up front in a sensory system that does the transduction. We've talked a lot about the cis-trans isomerization. But after the cis-trans isomerization in the retina, for example, we know that we have many synapses even within the retina, 
And then information leaves the retina out on the optic nerve. It leaves through the optic disc, generating a blind spot perceptually. It goes off to the thalamus into a particular nucleus called the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then it moves along the optic radiations, eventually back here to the primary visual cortex. So we can ask, for a given stimulus, how much time is needed to get from the uh, transduction uh, portion of our central nervous system, in this case, the transduction is done by the photoreceptors, um, how much time is needed from that point all the way back here to the visual cortex? And here's a, a nice graph that shows that relationship. Here we're mapping the latency to cortical responses in milliseconds. Okay. So faster responses are going to have lower latencies. Right? So you can think of it as briefer reaction times. Up here we have longer reaction times. And on this axis we have now the physical stimulus and its intensity. And we can talk about having a relatively intense light or a much lower, lower intensity light down on this end. And as we increase the intensity of the light, we're getting faster and faster responses back here at the visual cortex. So we might begin to ask ourselves the question, why is that the case? Some students find this to be very intuitive, but others find it to be not so intuitive. So let's see if we can unpack this a little bit. I'll ask you to join me in going out to the other PowerPoint for this session. We have a supplementary PowerPoint file for the Pulfric effect, and that's shown here. And we'll start out with the same graph as we had a moment ago. Again, greater intensity corresponds to faster cortical responses. Here's the graph that we had just a moment ago. We'll, we'll begin with a mantra for today. Excuse me. Okay. And today's mantra will be that sensory neurons differ in firing threshold. Can we all say that together? Sensory neurons differ in firing threshold. There you go. Okay, that's today's mantra. And it helps us to understand this graph that is setting up the Pulfric effect, a very important uh, illusion in depth perception. Okay, to understand this mantra, sensory neurons differ in firing threshold, let's see if we can plot a slightly different kind of graph. We'll have stimulus intensity on this, as we did a moment ago, on this x-axis. This is high levels of, of stimulus intensity, very bright light over here. This might be the case, for example, in your left eye, when the left eye is receiving high numbers of photons because the left eye had been unfiltered. On the other extreme of the stimulus intensity spectrum, we have very low intensity. We might think of that as being your right eye when it's filtered, especially when it's filtered by maybe appropriately aligned polarized filters. When we're blocking out a lot of the light, we're getting very low levels of light intensity here. Okay? So that'll be the x-axis, stimulus intensity. On the y-axis, we're going to be plotting firing rate, or the number of action potentials that a given neuron might be offering uh, per unit time, maybe per second. And so we can talk about one, two, or three action potentials. We might scale that up by about a hundredfold to make this a little bit more biologically plausible. And we might talk about the firing rate of a given neuron uh, in response to different intensities of light. Okay. So what we're going to do now is start to put on some plots that are going to give us an intuition about this mantra, sensory neurons differ in firing threshold. I'm going to show you some hypothetical data for four different sensory neurons, and those are shown here. They're shown in different colors. We'll start with the blue one that's on the left. And this particular neuron is low in threshold. Okay, it's a low threshold neuron. It's high in sensitivity. So let's see if we can understand what that means. When we have a really low level of light, we're not getting very many action potentials. We might be getting zero. As we increase the light intensity, this neuron begins to fire. And this is my gesticulation for action potentials. It begins to fire action potentials. And at some later point, it actually begins to asymptote. It goes as fast as it can go. Hypothetically, in this diagram, we'll say it's 300 spikes per second, or 300 action potentials per second. What's critical here is something a little bit similar to the issue of point of subjective equality that we had learned in a prior lecture. I can take, for example, a given level of firing, maybe 100 spikes per second. I can march over, drop down, and pull out the stimulus intensity that is needed to make this low threshold neuron fire, say, 100 times per second. Okay? And that might be a relatively low level of intensity. If I now play the same game for a different neuron, maybe the one that's shown over here in green, or the one that's over here in orange, I would do the same. I would start at 100 spikes per second as an arbitrarily chosen point on this axis, move over, and I see that I need a little bit more intensity in order to drive this neuron to a firing rate of 100 spikes per second. I would need even a little more still to drive that neuron shown here in orange. 
a little more intensity to get that one going, and I need quite a bit more intensity to come all the way over here to pick up the same level of activity and this neuron that's shown in red, this is a high threshold neuron. It's relatively insensitive to light. It will respond to light, but we need a lot of light to get even a little bit of firing. So you'll recall from Intro to Psychology that we have this inverse relationship between sensitivity and threshold. Low threshold corresponds to high sensitivity. Okay? So here we have a relatively low threshold in our uh, stimulus intensity light, and this is a relatively high sensitive, highly sensitive neuron. And then over here, we have a high threshold neuron that is relatively less sensitive. Okay? So this gives you some idea about the different kinds of cortical neurons that we might have in any kind of sensory system. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the visual system. So sensory neurons differ in their firing threshold. Okay? Only sensitive neurons, shown here in blue, fire at low intensities. Less sensitive neurons, that's the one shown in this reddish color, fire at high stimulus intensities, and if I have a really intense stimulus, if I've got uh, a very bright light and I leave it on for a long period of time, you might imagine that all, or almost all, that's why I put this in air quotes, almost all neurons will be firing maximally. Some neurons might have a maximal firing rate of 300 times per second, others might have only 100 times per second. Whatever their maximal rate is, if we have a really intense stimulus, we get both the sensitive neurons and the less sensitive neurons firing full steam ahead at their maximum rate of action potentials per second. Okay? Okay, so let's see if we can now zoom in and see a schematic about what might be going on. Here we have a schematic of a presynaptic neuron, as you might recall from Intro to Psychology. Here's the gap between that neuron and the next neuron, which we refer to as the postsynaptic neuron. We call that gap the synapse, as you might remember. Okay? And then once this neuron fires, what happens is there's a release of neurotransmitter into the synapse, and that's shown here on these, these bright dots. And so we have this kind of arrangement. Here's the presynaptic neuron. Here's the postsynaptic neuron. This postsynaptic neuron, as you might recall, has these dendrites. And these dendrites are going to begin summing up and integrating over all of this neurotransmitter, sometimes we'll get a particular molecule fitting right into a postsynaptic receptor. Okay? And we get uh, basically a summation that goes on over here, where all of these uh, molecules of neurotransmitter are being summed in time. And what we can say is this. At higher stimulus intensities, uh, we're going to have the generation of more presynaptic neurotransmitter release. So as we saw a moment ago, when we have very high stimulus intensities, all the neurons, or almost all the neurons, are going to be firing, and they're going to be firing at their maximal rate. When that happens, we're getting relatively large amounts of neurotransmitter here available for postsynaptic summation. Okay? And what we are going to see is an increase in neurotransmitter uh, will drive the postsynaptic neuron more quickly to its own spiking threshold. So just like this neuron has a spiking threshold, so does the postsynaptic neuron. And this postsynaptic neuron will reach its own threshold relatively quickly when we have more and more and more presynaptic release. Okay? All right, so here's a very simple way to think about this. This is an analogy for any kind of neuron which we might call an integrate and fire neuron. In fact, most neurons follow this simple rule of integrating or summing up all of the chemical signals that are coming its way and eventually firing when it reaches its threshold. So we can think of this roughly as a bathtub and you can imagine that in this bathtub analogy when more faucets are turned on uh, we get a release of more water into the bathtub. The bathtub fills fills up quickly and spills over faster if we turn both of these on and if we turn both of them on to their maximum than if we had just one of them on or if we had just one of them on and it was simply trickling out water at a little, uh, a little bit per unit time. Okay? okay, so when more presynaptic neurons release more neurotransmitter, the postsynaptic neurons reach their spiking thresholds or spill over, metaphorically, faster than they otherwise would have. So as we crank up the intensity of say the light, or turn the intensity down by putting a light attenuating filter in front of your eye, okay? we're essentially altering the rate at which neurotransmitter is fa falling into the uh, synapses, and if we have a very intense kind of light, then we get the equivalent of more faucets uh, trickling in more water, and this will drive this neuron to its spiking threshold faster and faster. And that brings us back to where we started. We started with this diagram, 
where we had this relationship between the latency to cortical response on the y-axis and light intensity over here. And when we have very intense lights, we get relatively fast responses in the visual cortex for the reasons that we've just laid out um, physiologically. Okay. So with that as background, We'll flip back over, if you'll join me in our original PowerPoint presentation for the Pulfric Effect, and this is where we left off. We now have some idea about what, what causes this particular relationship between stimulus intensity and the latency of cortical response. Now we'll go to a diagram that sometimes confuses students. We might have to do this in class as well, but I wanted to introduce it here to make a connection between what you will be experiencing in the Pulfric Effect and something that you learned in prior lectures when we talked about retinal disparities. So we're going to show you a schematic of this pendulum swinging back and forth. The ball is on a string. It's swinging in the horopter. And we'll see if we can make a connection between what's going on here, what we know about retinal disparities, and what we just learned in the most recent slides about the relationship between stimulus intensity and the latency of cortical responses. That's a lot to pull together, but we're going to give it a shot. Okay, so we're going to take a slice out of this ball's trajectory as it's moving back and forth in a pendulum-like way. And we're going to pretend, as always, that you've got the filter in front of your right eye. You're viewing this stimulus with both eyes open, but your right eye is being attenuated by the filter, maybe a little bit, or maybe it's being attenuated a lot. Okay, and we can systematically alter the level of light that's reaching your right eye. Okay, so here's the ball in its leftward trajectory, and we can talk about the ball very simply at different points in its trajectory, point one, two, three, four, five, and six, different regions of space, also different units of time as it's moving leftward. So we've got a filter before your right eye, and the motion is leftward, okay? And here are the dot positions at each instant in time. Okay, let's see if we can understand what's going on at the level of the cortex. We know at the level of the retina, this is entirely planar. It's entirely in the horopter, so we're at zero disparity. Through our left eye, which is unfiltered, we get a relatively veridical report of the ball's position. Let's take a hypothetical slice of time at time four, and the ball is positioned actually right here. And because we have relatively bright light coming from that white ball into this eye, we have a relatively fast response reaching the cortex. Okay? So the left eye's input is received relatively quickly back here at the cortex. At the cortex, we're going to have some cells that are innervated by left eye input, and also by right eye input. So let's see what's going on in the right eye's view for this particular cortical cell. Well, under this viewing condition, we have a filter in front of the right eye. And because we have a filter in front of the right eye, we're not going to get the same latency to cortical response from the right eye as we would from the left eye. Specifically, the right eye's transmission is going to be slowed. Just to be clear, the speed of light doesn't change, right? Light will pass through that filter and reach the retina at the same time that it's that is happening on the left eye's view as it is on the right eye's view. That doesn't change. But the rate at which information is transmitted from any of the eyes through the thalamus back to the cortex will depend on the intensity of this eye. So the right eye's view is going to be relatively slowed. The ball is right here in position four, but that's not what we're reporting to the cortex. Instead, what we report to the cortex is that because we have this delay, we're effectively reporting to the cortex that at this instant in time, the ball position is back one or two steps. And that's arising directly from the delay that we have. So we're saying from our left eye's view that the ball is right here, we delay the right eye's view, and we essentially give the cortex, if you will, yesterday's news. Yesterday, metaphorically speaking, we were back a position or two, okay, in the leftward trajectory, of this ball. And so we have to ask what's happening now from the cortex's perspective when it's receiving this kind of binocular input. The left eye's input is received quickly. The right eye's input is delayed by the filter, as we had seen in the previous slide. Input from the right eye is effectively displaced. Right? It's actually set back in time. So that's going to be put one or two steps rightward back in time, creating an uncrossed disparity or a far perception. Just so we can all understand that very clearly, let's go back and do our uh, disparity trick that we learned the other day in class. We can have our left eye's view, pardon my back, and the right eye's view. And if we had no filter before the eyes, both eyes would be seeing this at position four. Well, actually, both eyes are still sitting at position four, but because we're delaying this right eye's view, we're moving it back once, 
or twice, giving an older report to the cortex because we have a delay. And because we have that delay, we now have the equivalent of an uncrossed disparity. And whenever we're uncrossing our arms or have an uncrossed disparity, then the psychological consequence of that physiological stimulation here at the cortex is that something will appear to be further in depth than is the fixation point. So by putting the filter in front of the right eye, we're still at zero retinal disparity, but we're fooling the cortex into thinking that it's got an older position in time, and specifically that we have a uncrossed disparity. This will now not look as if it's in its actual position, it will look further away from you in depth in this particular case. If you take your filters and you crank them up such that you're now really, really attenuating the light reaching the right eye, we can create an even larger disparity as we have shown here. Once again, we're creating an uncrossed disparity, but this time an uncrossed disparity of great magnitude. So now we have a strong filter before the right eye's view, okay? and the right eye's input is further delayed by this stronger filter. So input from the right eye is displaced even further rightward, creating an even larger uncrossed disparity, looking even further in depth. Okay? So we hope that is clear to you. Just to make sure that it's really clear, we're going to do the reverse case also. We'll leave the filter hypothetically in front of your right eye, but we'll now catch the ball as it's moving on its other trajectory, now off to the left-hand side. Excuse me, now, now the ball is moving toward your right, pardon me. So we still have the right eye covered as always, and the ball is now moving off to the right. Okay? All right, and just to show you that there's nothing special about position four, in this diagram we'll pick up the story at position number five. It works in a very similar manner. If we had no filtration in front of either of the eyes, we can take a look at the ball at position number five. Our left eye would be here, our right eye would be here, and everything would be fine. We'd per perceive this veridically. But we actually don't perceive it veridically when we put a light filter in front of the right eye's view. The left eye's view remains exactly where it is, okay? but the right eye's view is going to be delayed. Now because the trajectory is rightward, we're going to go back in time to yesterday's news or the day before yesterday's news, depending on the magnitude of the delay, and you can see that my arms are now crossed. So uh, equivalently now, I have cross disparities back here at the cortex, and you will now perceive those cross disparities as having an object closer to you in depth as opposed to further away in depth. So cross disparities are near to you, uncrossed disparities are far to you. Okay? And if it is the case that I now attenuate that light even further by putting an even stronger filter before your right eye, I can now get an even larger uncrossed disparity than I had a moment ago, and I can further exaggerate this uncrossed disparity and the corresponding near percept. So uh, in this particular case, when the ball is moving to your right, you will have the ball seem very near to you, okay? and then when it's moving to your left, it'll seem very far away from you. And yet all the while, the ball is just in the horopter. It's in the plane of zero disparity, but we're fooling the cortex into thinking that there is a mismatch. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is take a moment and see if you can jot down anything that was particularly clear about this explanation, thinking all the way back to zero disparity, horopters, crossed and uncrossed disparities, uh, near and far percepts that correspond to those retinal disparities. You might think a little bit about that physiological slide where we saw that as the light intensity increases, we get a decrease in latency or a hastening of the response. And you might think about these diagrams here for the pulvic effect, and we'll let you jot that down, what was clear and also what was not so clear, and then we'll continue from here. Let's continue with a conversation on random dot stereograms. Here we're going to see first what random dot stereograms are and how they're related to stereopsis. After that, we'll consider why these are so theoretically important for depth perception, but also for understanding the visual system more generally. And then toward the very end of this section, we'll also learn a little bit about what random dot stereograms demonstrate for us with respect to an ongoing debate about the relative merits of what we might call laboratory science versus field science. Laboratory that's done, uh, science that's done inside of a laboratory versus science that's done uh, out in the field. We'll see something about the relative strengths of each of those two as we're talking about random dot stereograms. So let's begin by understanding a little bit about what these are like, random dot stereograms, also called RDSs. 
So random dot stereograms are binocularly presented stimuli that consist either of black or white pixels randomly. Okay? And so we're going to have something in your left eye's view and something else in your right eye's view. You'll have this in the handout that's given to you in class, and we'll show you an example of this in a moment. The pixel values in one eye's view are spatially correlated with those in the other eye's view, except for a special region that can be seen in depth. And we'll show you that in just one moment. We will mention here, though, that this special binocularly correlated region is laterally displaced in one eye's view. So sometimes a picture will say a thousand words. Again, this will be on the handout that you have for that day. And we'll ask you to try free fusing this. You might recall that in a prior session, we had done some free fusing by giving you an index card when you placed in between your two eyes. And it uh, worked as a septum, which segregated the left eye's view from the right eye's view. And after you relaxed your eye muscles and got them to diverge, that refers to the angle at which the eyes are pointing, such that you were looking a little bit further away than the stimulus itself, and you got your eyes to relax a little bit with respect to accommodation, which is just how much your lenses are bending. And you bring these two into focus after the two images have slid together. You would see something like this. It would be perfectly flat. And just to give you some idea about how this is constructed, let's start over here on the left-hand side. We can pretend that we have a 200 by 200 pixel image. And we're going to have a computer generate either a black or a white value in each of those pixels randomly. So we might go to the very first pixel in our 200 by 200 array. And we would ask our computer to generate either a black or white value there, maybe by flipping a virtual coin. If the coin comes up heads, we might give a black value there. If it comes up tails, we might give a white value there. And then we move up to the next pixel, and we do that for all the pixels in this image. Then what we do is, inside of PowerPoint, we would grab all that information and make a copy of it over here in the right eyes view and ask our students to stereoscopically fuse this using their index card as a septum to separately stimulate the left eye and right eyes view, as we've done in class. Okay. Now, uh, what you can see here is that if this and this were exactly the same copies, uh, this was simply a copy of that, then all of the points would be at zero disparity. They would be at the horopter. And you would have no perception of depth. These two would be perfectly correlated. There would be zero binocular disparity. In an actual random dot stereogram, we do that and one more thing. As we mentioned a moment ago, we take a particular special region and we displace it spatially in one eye's view relative to the other. So here you might be able to see that I've got a black marker drawn around a square region. And I'm going to take that region, find it over here, and then displace it a little bit to this side. Just so you can see that there is a spatial displacement in the right eye's view, I'll take my Jimi Hendrix peace sign, something like that, and we'll pretend that these are something like first down markers in American football. I'll place those right here, so you can see that we have a certain interval from this white border to the border where the black square is starting. Okay? Then over here, if I use that same indicator, you'll notice that I don't have exactly the same alignment. That is, you can see that this black border has been shifted a little bit to the left in this right eye's view. Okay? So the displacement is leftward in the right eye's view, which generates a cross disparity and appears near in depth. So one more time, just like we've done several times before, we will remind you of how these disparities are working. Let's say that we've got our left eye's view here, okay? and our right eye's view is right here. And what we can do is, in this particular case, displace that square in the right eye's view a little bit leftward in the right eye's view. Okay? And as I'm doing that, and I've got a leftward displacement in my right eye's view, I've got a crossed disparity. And that's going to make this square pop out at you uh, in depth. It's going to come nearer to you. Now, back over here, where we were just a moment ago, you can't see that we have any square that's embedded in there. And I picked a square, but I could have picked a circle. I could have picked a triangle pointing upward, or pointing to your right, or pointing to your left, or downward. I could have picked letters. I could have made letters out of all of this and had them displaced leftward or rightward in one or the other eye's views. And those would pop out at you in depth or further away from you in depth. Okay? So we can pick, take one of those regions and have them um, move closer or further away in depth by having crossed or uncrossed disparities. Okay? So in random dot stereograms, the central form is monocularly invisible. Just to remind you, back two slides, you don't see a central square here. 
In fact, even though you personally know that there is a square there, it's really hard for you to find where that square is. Okay? It's not monocularly visible. Only after binocular matching, which is performed by cells back here in the visual cortex, only after binocular matching is the form seen. Now that's interesting. Okay? Until the 1960s, when these were developed by a researcher named Bella Ulez, who spent much of his career at Rutgers University, until the 1960s, it was believed stereopsis required monocularly visible forms in one eye to be matched with those in the other eye. In fact, it was as early as the 1830s that a fellow named Wheatstone figured this out, and he did basically what you and I now call the geek trick. That is, we take a picture of you just like this, click, we go over 6.5 centimeters and we take another one, and then we look at those two images. He had a special device that would make it easier for you to synthesize those images. But we could see, for example, uh, an image of me in the left eye's view and a spatially displaced image of me in the right eye's view. But in either eye's view, the image of me would be monocularly visible. By contrast, over here in the random dot stereogram, we don't have anything that's monocularly visible. This entire pattern and this entire pattern simply looks like, if you will, visual noise, randomness of this black and white pixel set. Okay. So until the 1960s, it was believed that stereopsis required monocularly visible forms to be matched in the two eyes. Random dot stereograms were a theoretical breakthrough because they demonstrated that stereopsis can precede monocular form perception. Typically, we had thought, and traditionally, we had thought we need a monocular form in the right eye's view, a monocular form in the left eye's view. We need to synthesize those two. And after having those forms and synthesizing them, then we get the depth. This now spins that sequence around, and we can extract depth first. And once the depth is extracted, we could say, aha, the form that's been extracted is now rectangular or square or triangular or circular, whatever the case might be. So this was really an interesting breakthrough and told us a lot about how the visual cortex works with stereopsis. We actually don't have to have form preceding stereopsis. We can have stereopsis preceding form, interestingly enough. OK, so what is the evolutionary benefit of seeing random dot stereograms? You might say that there's uh, essentially no evolutionary benefit to this. These are laboratory stimuli. Uh, clearly, we didn't evolve to see random dot stereograms. Uh, so what's going on with this? Why would we bother doing this? Do random dot stereograms occur in nature? Well, probably not. Although I'll give you a potential similarity between random dot stereograms and uh, something that does occur in nature in just a moment. But a critic of laboratory sciences might make the following claim. Those laboratory stimuli, like random dot stereograms, are unrealistic. Why don't you get out of the laboratory and study stimuli in the real world? And there can be a lot of benefit to doing that. This kind of a claim might be a claim made by somebody like uh, Gibson. And there's a lot of value in taking Gibson's advice and trying to understand naturalistic stimuli. That's a very important uh, approach to visual science. It's not the only approach to, to vision science. So this might be one answer to this question that some critics of laboratory science might pose. The response might be something like this. The laboratory reveals how systems work by systematically isolating variables. In many naturalistic environments, variables are not easily isolated. So by using random dot stereograms, for example, we can isolate the relative contributions of monocularly visible form to, uh, and, and binocular disparity to the perception of depth. Okay? Those are actually different ideas, monocular form, retinal disparity, or binocular disparity. How are those relatively contributing to our perception of depth? We can investigate this in the laboratory, but we never find these stimuli out in the real world. They actually don't exist in the real world. But we can reveal how the system is working, emphasis here on how the system is working, by going into the laboratory and creating these highly artificial stimuli that will push the, the visual system, in this case, into revealing some of its secrets. Okay? So without laboratory based, the laboratory-based discovery of random dot stereograms, it, we'd falsely believe that form perception has to precede stereoscopic depth perception. And we now know that it can go the other way around. Okay? So that's a pretty interesting finding, a pretty nice uh, laboratory demonstration of why it's important to isolate variables and uh, try to understand how the system is working. Another example that we've seen this semester, just to remind you, is uh, available to us right up here. As we look at the words random dot stereograms here, we see that this is written in a color that appears yellow to you. However, we, we learned in a prior session 
that we really don't have 590 nanometer stimulation here. Instead, we have what we might call the red gun and the green gun superimposing at each pixel. And that correspondence between the red beam and the green beam, green beam if I can color the light that way, using the vulgar, gives us the illusion of yellowness, the equivalent of a 590 nanometer light. So what's nice about that is we can make our computer displays and our telephone displays and our iPads much more economically feasible by not having to have all possible colors at a given pixel location. We only need to have three beams, a red and a green and a blue, because we know something about how the system works, how it is vulnerable to metamers, and we can take advantage of what we know about how the system works, and we can create more effective computer displays and iPads and so forth. In the world of stereopsis, we can talk about how it is that you can take a picture of uh, the forest from maybe right about here and the picture of the forest from right about here and now spatially superimpose those two. And you might see that you don't just have forest there, you actually have a camouflaged uh, enemy trooper or you have a camouflaged tank coming your way. In fact, it was in the 1960s that the military was supporting researchers like Bella Ulez to try to decamouflage some tanks that might have been buried in forestry. And reconnaissance flights flying over a area of interest might be able to take two pictures, one here, one here. We can synthesize those two. And something that's embedded in thick forest, kind of like a random dot stereogram, uh, could in fact now be revealed to contain some kind of a form. So there are actually even practical benefits uh, once we understand how the system works, we can begin to uh, go even further than we might have if we had used only ecologically valid stimuli. Okay, so in just a moment, we'll return to, or we'll turn to a brand new phenomenon, one we hadn't discussed, uh, that is also ecologically unlikely to occur, doesn't happen in the real world, but tells us, we think, quite a bit about the visual system, and this is called binocular rivalry. Before we do that, though, why don't we take a moment to have you pause and see if you can uh, jot down what was particularly clear about random dot stereograms and what was less clear. Let's now turn to the issue of binocular rivalry. Binocular rivalry might be defined this way. The unstable percept that arises when the stimulus presented to one eye differs substantially from the stimulus presented to the other eye. Previously, we've talked about stereopsis, and we've already noted that in stereopsis, we get different images in the two eyes, but they're only slightly different. Here in binocular rivalry, we have a substantial difference between the two eyes, and this generates a very unstable percept. At any given point in space, one eye's view is perceptually dominant, and seen, while the other is perceptually suppressed and unseen. And this competition between the two eyes' views is the rivalry to which we refer. The suppression and dominance fluctuate over time, and it's very interesting that a lot of people who look at these kinds of stimuli report that it's really quite disconcerting to see this. Unlike stereopsis, where things fuse into solid vision, in binocular rivalry, we have this percept that changes over time, and it's very difficult to describe, very difficult to make sense out of. So maybe the best way to do this is to let you get some direct experience with binocular rivaling stimuli yourself, and we'll do this in class by using this handout. In the handout that you'll have, you'll see a stimulus in the left eye's view that's tilted clockwise from vertical, and you'll have a stimulus in the right eye's view that's tilted, uh, uh, that's clockwise, that's counterclockwise, excuse me. They're tilted in opposite orientations from vertical, anti-clockwise in the left, clockwise in the right. And you'll have a index card that will serve as your septum and that will allow you to segregate your left eye's view from your right eye's view and will allow you to relax your eyes, get the vergence and divergence to uh, appropriately allow for these two images to slide one on top of the next. But unlike the case in stereopsis, here for binocular rivalry, what we will see is that this will be a little bit unsettling. The two will come together, but they won't form any kind of a stable image. And really quite interesting, and we'll give you a few moments in class to practice this. It takes a little bit of uh, motor practice to dissociate our vergence from our accommodation, but we'll get them into alignment, and you'll see what this is like. We'll also move on from there, and we'll take a look at some rivaling stimuli that are generated by having red and blue filters over the two eyes. 
The stimulus that we might use is one that's very commonly used in MRI experiments on binocular rivalry, and the stimulus is something like this. Through one of your eyes, you will have a a view that is filtered by your blue filter and you'll see vertically oriented bars in that eyes view. And then we'll have a stimulus that is as different as possible in the orientation domain. We'll have now red stimuli that are horizontally oriented and these will now be in the other eyes view. So you'll get this in one eye, this in the other eye. These are not slightly different, they're very different. And what you might notice is that you get this patchy experience. That is, one patch of your visual field might look momentarily vertical and blue. Another patch might look momentarily horizontal and red. And then after a few seconds, it might be that one of those two dominates, but only for a second or two, and that percept will go away, and you'll get another fleeting percept of the opposite orientation. So uh, these are really quite interesting to look at, but they're a little bit disconcerting. Okay. So presently, researchers in the MRI lab at Stanford University are using binocular rivalry as a tool for probing consciousness. And it would be fun to hear what you have to say about the definition of consciousness. Recall that we had read a book by Nick Lane, uh, at least a chapter within a book by Nick Lane, and that chapter was on consciousness. And we talked a lot about consciousness early in the semester. Here it comes back again as we're talking about binocular rivalry. I'd be interested in your definition of consciousness. So that might be one of the things uh, that you can bring to class for our next session. Here's a, a fun definition that was offered somewhat tongue-in-cheek by a researcher named Christoph Koch who is at Caltech. And he says that consciousness is that which goes away when we sleep. Okay, so you might uh, say that that has some truth to it. You might also think that's not a particularly helpful uh, definition. In any case, some people would say that consciousness is a very slippery topic, but nevertheless, maybe we can get a foothold into this slippery topic of consciousness by looking at binocular rivalry stimuli inside of an MRI device. Typically, what would happen is you'd be wearing your red and blue glasses inside of the MRI device, and they would show you a stimulus very much like the one we see here and they let the rivalry take its place. And then what will happen is you will report that you're getting a vertical experience and you'll hold down one button when the verticals are, are dominating. You'll hold down a different button when the horizontals are dominating. And meanwhile, the researchers are recording the blood oxygen level dependent signal or the bold signal in the MRI device, particularly in visually active portions of the brain. And they attempt to see if there's some correspondence between your very subjective psychological experience that is changing moment by moment without them controlling it and also what's going on inside of your blood oxygen level dependent signal, probably in area V1. Okay, so um, let's see if we can now begin to summarize what we've learned about trying to combine the two eyes views. We've talked a little bit about stereopsis and a little bit about binocular rivalry. And this is what we can say. When both eyes are stimulated simultaneously, one possible perceptual experience is that the two images are fused into a unified, stable percept. This is what we spent a lot of time learning about in stereopsis, and this is what we typically experience um, subjectively, day to day, that the world is three-dimensional and we get a very stable percept of the world. Even when the world itself is quite dynamic, we still see the individual objects quite saliently and quite stably uh, as being three-dimensional. In this other case, this alternative case, the visual system may be unable to view, to, to fuse the two images. We get a left eyes view that might be like this and a right eyes view that might be like this or vice versa. And uh, we have this experience of binocular rivalry where the, st the perception is very unstable. Okay? So what you might do is jot down any questions that you have about binocular rivalry before we go on to our next section, which will be our final section and we'll deal with motion parallax. We'll give you a moment to stop the video and jot down what you need to jot down, including a definition of consciousness. Okay, why don't we go on and we'll talk about motion parallax. So motion parallax is going to be our final section of this presentation and it will be a monocular depth cue. Just to remind you of some other monocular depth cues that we've had, we've talked a little bit about the monocular depth cue called linear perspective, and we saw some examples of that in this beautiful chalk art that had uh, shown us that at one angle we get compelling depth, but if we go to a slightly different angle, we see a grossly disfigured uh, image. 
And uh, that was a really nice case of a monocular depth cue called linear perspective. We also have occlusion. We talked about how uh, objects can occlude one and the next, and what the object that is nearer to us in depth uh, tends to be occluding what is ever uh, behind it in depth. So those are some monocular uh, depth cues. Here we have another one, and this is quite interesting uh, because it's going to give us information about uh, um, objects in the Z plane or in the depth plane as we talked about and this information will be available in one eye just as was true for linear perspective or for occlusion um, but now this is going to be a dynamical depth cue unlike the other ones which were stationary okay so let's see if we can define it first and then we'll see if we can get you uh, to do a little demonstration even with this video uh, on motion parallax so here's the definition Motion parallax is a monocular depth cue based on the differences in relative motion between images of objects at different distances. Uh, remember that we're interested in surmising what's where inside of the Z plane or the Z axis. So we'll do a demo on this in, in class and we'll also do this here. I won't walk you through each of these steps, um, reading them out loud. Instead, we'll just point and I think this might be more intuitive to you. So in this demo on motion parallax, we're going to have three points in the z-plane. We're going to have the most distant point, we'll have an intermediate point, and we'll have the nearest point. We're going to make the most distant point, the m, in this word, motion parallax, or that phrase, motion parallax, we'll make it the most distant one. We'll make the intermediate point our right thumb. I'll ask you to fully extend your right arm. You can even do this as you're watching the video. Okay? And I'm going to line up my right thumb with the distant m. I'm going to close one eye. I'll close my left eye, so I'm doing this now with my right eye, my right thumb, and I've got that lined up with the M. And then I'm going to bring my other thumb, which would be my left thumb, to some point in between my eye and my more distant right thumb. So now I have three items in a row. I've got the most distant M. I've got the central thumb, which is my right thumb. I'm wiggling that now. And then I have the most near thumb, and those three are all in alignment. What I'll ask you to do now is to try to bring your focus to this central thumb, that's the object in the middle, and try to keep your focus right there, and slowly move your head to the left, and then to the right, and then to the left, and to the right. All the while, remember that we have to have one eye closed. We're doing this with just our right eye open, so we're using a monocular depth cue, and you might notice something very interesting as you move your head from one side to the next. Specifically, as I move my head to the right, I notice that the most distant M also moves to the right, although it does so very slowly. When I move my head to the left, I notice that the M again follows me, this time to the left, but it does so very slowly. All the while, I'm looking with one eye just at that central thumb. Something very different happens for my nearer thumb, in this case, my left thumb. So looking again with one eye, I'll go left and then right, left and then right, and I'm looking with uh, one eye at the central thumb, and I'll notice that my left thumb appears to be moving opposite to my head. So this near object, my left thumb, is moving opposite to my head position, and the distant M is moving in correspondence with my head position. One is moving with my head, one is moving against my head. I'm getting different relative motions from these two very different uh, positions in the Z-plane. Okay. All right, so we have then the experience that's consistent with this definition that objects at different distances have different relative motion. Just to put this back into perspective and to bring it all home back to stereopsis, even though this is a monocular depth cue, let's take a look at this image and see if we can find a similarity between the monocular depth cue called motion parallax and what we already know about stereopsis. So motion parallax is related to stereopsis. The fixation point F, shown here, will always stimulate corresponding retinal areas. So here F is projecting to F1 in the left eye's view. At a slightly different vantage point, we have the right eye's view. F is projecting to F2 there. Okay. So that's our point of fixation, and that's the horopter is the plane that will contain that point of fixation, the, point of, the plane of zero disparity. Okay. Now we can have some object that we'll call A that will now project to non-corresponding retinal points, uh, and this object is nearer in depth than F is. Okay, so that might be akin to our left thumb, which was moving opposite to our head motion uh, just a little while ago. Okay? So what you can see from this diagram is that point A will stimulate various non-corresponding uh, retinal areas as you move back and forth. And if you moved 6.5 centimeters leftward or rightward, hopefully that number is very familiar to you by now, 6.5 centimeters leftward or rightward, you'd mimic the binocular depth cue of stereopsis.
So if I am looking with just one eye and I start in this position, and then I move over to that position and back and forth, over time, I'm picking up information to use the Gibsonian phrase that I would have had with two eyes open. But now I'm picking them up in time rather than simultaneously in two different locations, and I'm generating these non-corresponding uh, retinal points of stimulation. And that would give me something about the relative motion of these objects that are nearer or further than the fixation plane, and I might be able to use that to surmise what's where on the z-axis. So with that said, that concludes our session on depth, and I'd like you to jot down what things were particularly clear, what things were unclear, and bring that to class. See you in class.